Our speaker today, our distinguished lecturer, is Professor Christopher Weichel from the Department of Statistics at the University of Missouri. So Chris, is a, <clears throat> as he's known, is Curator's Distinguished Professor and Chair of Statistics, or was Chair, recently um, he's handed over those reins to a colleague uh, at the University of Missouri with additional appointments in soil, environmental and atmospheric sciences and the Truman School of Public Affairs. The title of Chris's talk is The Ship Has Sailed, Where Should We Steer It? Climate Adaptation Needs Uncertainty Quantification. With that, welcome Chris. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you, Noel, for that uh, very nice introduction. Thank you for, for being here today um, and taking some time out of your busy schedules um, to come join us. As Noel said, um, when I, I'm, I'm honored to do this given the, the history of this lecture um, and I appreciate the committee's um, endorsement. But what his, his comment to me was, make it a public lecture and talk about climate. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, I've been working in climate for a long time, but most of what I do in climate has been with forecasting and sort of medium range type forecast. But then I thought, well, no, actually, I've been doing a lot of stuff with adaptation late, lately, and I think that's probably the biggest thing that, that we need to think about. So that's what I'm going to do. I think I might have one or two equations in this talk. Um, if you want more equations, um, I'm going to give a talk tomorrow. But um, this is more um, truly a public lecture. So I'd like you to focus on this quote for a minute. Um, it, it's really, the word unequivocally here is, is crucial. Basically, we are seeing global warming. There's no uncertainty about that anymore, okay? Um, by the way, the IPCC, I have some quotes from that. That's the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. And, um, they produce these reports periodically, and this is from the most recent report. So unequivocally, we are experiencing global warming. And it's going to continue. Um, greenhouse gases emissions are increasing in every sector. Um, you know, and it's due to many things, land use, unsustainable energy use, land use changes, um, just consumption patterns of, of communities, of individuals. Uh, and this is, again, with high confidence. There, there's no question that this is happening. And so we're already seeing the impacts of this, right, in, in weather and climate extremes. And honestly, some of these are very recent. Every day you can, you can pull up a news article about some kind of climate extreme event or weather extreme event that's going on. Uh, any part of the world. Uh, we just had um, a tremendous... Uh, unfortunate hurricane sequence in the U.S. a few, um, few weeks ago and uh, unprecedented in terms of the flooding that was, was um, uh, corresponded with that. And so the, the thing about this is, it's like you think, well, can't we fix this? And, and what if we think about, um, you know, some things, some parts of this are, are unavoidable, right? There's some things, you know, we can't get back, but if you look at the IPC report, they think, well, if we had a rapid and sustained reduction of emissions, maybe we could get back to some sort of stable equilibrium. And that would actually require net zero CO2 emissions. So basically, no more. No more CO2 emissions. And to do that, the window to get to zero CO2 emissions is actually very narrow. No, we don't have much time to do it, within a decade, okay. So the IPCC authors think that the ship's still at port, right? We still have time, we can still do something about it. Um, if we act now, and if we act globally, together. But that's gonna require political will. And I suspect that, again, pull any headline out that you want, the idea of sort of global cooperation um, is really not in vogue these days. And typically, the kinds of national governments that are, that are coming, I guess, I don't want to make this a political talk, but uh, I'm, I'm going to say that it's probably not likely 
that there's a political will at the national level and the international level to make these changes. So I don't think we can count on that. I don't think it's going to happen. Um, I don't think that we're going to get to zero emissions. It's basically the ship has sailed. Um, not only in time, but ever, in my opinion. Okay, that's the, pre that's the, the, the point of, of, I guess, starting point of this talk. And so I have been told this before, that I am a pessimist, and I found this quote, and I thought, oh, I like this quote. So a pessimist complains about the wind, the optimist expects it to change, and the realist adjusts the sails. I think it's time to adjust the sail. I really am, I see myself as a realist. I'm an optimist, but you know, hope for the best, plan for the worst, right? So we need to live with or we need to adapt to climate change. And so what does that even mean? Well, um, resilience is a term that's often used in this context, and it kind of means what you think it means in just in terms of everyday English. Basically, the capacity to cope with this change. Yeah, so if, if the climate's going to change, can we just accept it and, and sort of live our lives in a way that can still uh, work around some of these issues? And there's one part of this that's important, and that's this last part, which still maintain the capacity to adapt. Right? Because, okay, I can, I can accept the fact that it's going to happen perhaps, but I still need to leave open the door that I might need to adapt as I go along. And so adaptation also has some... Uh, a definition in the context of climate change, and that's the idea of adjustment to these expected changes in the climate, right? Moderate the harm or exploit it in, in a positive way, if, if that's even possible. So this is actually from um, a science article, uh, the journal Science, a few years ago. And it's kind of cool, right? You can think about adaptation, like floating cities and, you know, growing trees out your your patio and all this sort of thing. I don't think we're quite ready for that. Um, it might be kind of cool, science fiction. Um, but I think there's, there are ways that we can still go about this. And importantly, we already have. And, and there's examples of this. Um, the sea, uh, in, in the um, Western um, Sahel region of Africa, the, the um, indigenous communities there have long been able to adapt to seasonal and, and long-term changes in climate. So that's, that's something that's just done all the time. Back in the 1930s, there was a tremendous drought in the U.S. in the central and the, and the wheat belt of the, of the U.S. and it caused what's called, what's called the Dust Bowl. And, and it led to a, a vast migration to, to California out of the, the central plains of the U.S. But even now, this is, all, this is happening again. This is happening due to climate change now. And this is a fairly recent article um, about families um, in uh, an island off of Panama being forced to, to leave due to the rising sea levels of that, of that island. And so this is happening. People are adapting one way or the other. Well, it turns out that there's a whole science about the adaptation uh, uh, to climate change. And I'm not an expert on that. Uh, we'll get to what I actually am an expert in at some point here. But the, it's interesting to read about it. And there's really five points that, about adaptation. There's five ways that you can do this. You can resist it, like, no, I'm, you know, I'm just going to bury my head in the sand. There are politicians who do that. You can accommodate, which means I'm just going to accept it and then adjust as I go. Or you could avoid it. Maybe I'll, um, well, it just, kind of obvious, we could retreat back from it, or we can advance, we can come up with new technologies. So I could probably spend 10 minutes on this figure, I won't, but if you ever get a chance, I highly recommend that you take a look at it because it's really informative. If you think about this, um, this um, area here, this city that's going to be inundated by rising sea levels, there's all sorts of different options that could happen. These are cartoons, right, not real. Um, and, and they correspond to these different things. For example, advancement. So you sort of think about consolidating in different ways, the, um, moving the city and, and adjusting um, you know, where you get certain uh, components uh, 
of agriculture. But the, the point that I wanted to make here is that any reasonable adaptation strategy is going to be a combination of these things. Right? It's, it, there's not really one that's ever going to be appropriate. And so if you think about that, then there's got to be a lot of decisions that have to be made. Like, which way do we go? How do we do it? And it's not easy to do that, right? Think about, there's a whole, like I said, there's a whole field of study on, on what it takes to adapt. And it's a hard thing to do. Uh, the reason why it's hard in this case is because it's a very complex system that has a bunch of different moving parts across all sorts of different disciplines, many different stakeholders having different uh, points of view. And so that decision is going to have to bring everybody together or it's going to have to be autocratically um, implemented. And I think that the only way it's ever going to actually work is if people sort of came together and, and made decisions in some sort of a um, plausible framework. The thing that you have to be, this is just an example, who's going to speak for the marginalized people? In, in this? So, so not only do you have to think about your own interests, but you have to think about the interests for those that don't have the voice or might not speak up or not know how to speak up. So it's a difficult problem. And so I think it's additionally not only difficult, but it's local. I think it has to be made at the individual level. Perhaps I decide not to fly anymore. Um, that's a local decision that I can make. Or my community, or my city, or my state government perhaps makes that decision. It's going to require that we be able to model very complex systems across diverse disciplines that have a lot of uncertainty in our knowledge and in the data that come into that. So that's what a statistician is, that's what I think we're here for. So we can help make decisions in a formal decision theoretic framework that accommodates information and the uncertainty in that information. Not just data, but knowledge as well. We can consider probability distributions across a wide range of processes and scenarios uh, counterfactual scenarios, so what if this happens? You know, this is happening now, what if this happens? What's the distribution in that? And then in all of this, we have to quantify uncertainty. So I think this is why it's data science, right? To me, data science is bringing data and information into a framework where we can make decisions and make inference or make predictions about it. So this is the roadmap for the remainder of the talk, and it, it kind of looks like this. It's not as linear as it often is. Uh, but I think it, it'll work. Um, I'm going to talk about optimizing decisions, about Bayesian inference in that perspective, hierarchical models, the power of conditioning, and then some limitations of what we're doing now um, and needs for the future. And I'll, along the way, present some examples from my own work, because I feel like, you know, it's my talk. I can do that. Um, but there's probably better examples than this, but I, I'm using the ones from my talk. Um, OK, so how do you make decisions about um, this kind of thing? Well, we have to understand what it is that we even care about first, right? Um, for example, I'm going to use fish throughout this. I do a lot of work across a lot of different science areas. But I'm going to talk today about freshwater fish in rivers, because that's what I'm doing some adaptation stuff with. So let's say I care about the fish abundance in a, in a particular river system, OK? And so I'm going to obtain, uh, obtain a distribution associated with, with the various scenarios right, that I might be interested in or under what potential climate effects might happen. And so I'm going to, given those distributions, I'm going to make decisions about it. For example, maybe I should limit the amount of fishing that happens in the spring. Maybe I need to think about adding some habitat structures to, to increase abundance. Um, or maybe I need to limit. Um, the amount of uh, um, boat traffic or, or that happens in that particular area. So I'm going to, you know, there's multiple frameworks that one could make a decision here. I'm going to say that I'm going to take the Bayesian statistical approach for that, a Bayesian inference approach for that. And I hope to explain why as I go. But say I'm interested in um, fish weight. That's one measure of how, how well a fish would do. Yeah, um, you know, there's many, many others, but let's just say that. That's a measure of growth. And then I collect some data about that fish weight. And then I have some prior information about what the fish weight should be for this particular species in this particular environment. 
You know, that, where did that come from? Well, maybe I know because I've been working with fish for a long time. Maybe I've collected data in a previous study. Maybe I have theoretical reasons from bioenergetics why they should be what they are. And so Bayes' theorem or Bayes' rule is really just um, a, a fact of probability, which is says that if I've, what I'm interested in is updating my information about the fish weight given whatever information that I collect, okay, the data, D here. So that's called the posterior distribution. That's given by this. And then that can actually be shown. Um, that is just the distribution of uh, what I call the data given the truth or the likelihood. Say so that's given by this red curve here. And then that multiplied by the prior distribution. Again, this is my previous knowledge before I collect the data. That's given by the green. If I take that product, and I get this curve down here, which isn't a probability distribution because it doesn't integrate to one or doesn't sum to one. So if I take the area under that curve and divide by it, that's this. And then I get the posterior distribution back. So why is this useful? Because it allows me to combine information that I've collected versus my prior knowledge or other information that I might have available. So this idea, of course, has been around for centuries. Um, it can be also very useful for decision making. So say I've got um, the same process W, this fish weight thing. Um, I've got some data, and then I've got some actions. Like I said, maybe I, one action is to limit fishing, the other one is to build structures or something like that. So I have a, a collection of actions. So, so this isn't a fish, but um, this individual has two decisions to make. Like, do, I, do I go to the left, do I go to the right, whatever. So that's, that's an example. So if I'm gonna do that, I have to think about optimizing something. How do I make that decision? Now, again, we could argue whether individuals actually behave rationally or stuff, but assume that, that we, we do for the moment. And then we, we develop some sort of a loss. So, so what does that mean? It's just, if I take this action relative to the truth, what would that cost me? And so one of the most common loss functions that we think about in, in statistics and other areas is, is called squared error loss. But there's many, many others of these, right? Squared error loss is just looking at the difference between this truth and the action and then squaring that and kind of summing up over everything. Okay, so I'm going to say that there's multiple ways to make an optimal decision about the action to take, but I'm going to take the one that says I want to, I want to um, optimize relative to what's called the Bayes risk, or minimize the Bayes risk. And what does that mean? It just takes, it means I take that loss function, and I average over the potential weights that I could get, the distribution of those, okay? So with respect to this posterior distribution I talked about. And so if you cared, if you didn't want to just look at it this way, this is what it would look like, right? So what that means is I've got the uncertainty quantification comes from the Bayesian posterior that I have, this learning about the weights given the data and other my prior information, okay? So, so remember, that posterior is made up of two components. The data given the truth, which is something that I specify, like the data distribution, and then this prior distribution, which is probably the most important part of this. Okay, so what are the challenges? Well, first, you have to know what the collection of actions are. And, and that's harder than you might think, and I'm not gonna talk about that, because that's more of a scientific dis uh, discussion for a particular scenario. The other question is about which loss function do you care about? Maybe, maybe you have a different one than I do, right? Maybe, maybe you care about um, something that making a decision in one direction is gonna be worse than another one. So you could define your loss function that way. And again, I'm not gonna talk about that here but that also is a very important part of this. I'm gonna talk about the last one, which is, do we really know what this posterior distribution is? And, and in particular, do we know what that prior distribution is? And I think that's the, the big challenge in all of this, to be honest, one of the big challenges. So why don't I know that? Well, it's very complicated. Fish weight doesn't, I don't really know fish weight. Fish weight depends on so many factors. Um, how many fish there already are, the water temperature, the air temperature that, that influences the water temperature, um, local atmospheric conditions, climate scale. Oh, there's all these cascading things that come together that lead to this prior distribution. 
I'm going to say that it's what's called a hierarchical model, or thinking about a conditioning, conditional model can help with this. And again, I'm, pretty soon I'll get out of this equation stuff. But let's just say, uh, hierarchical model just comes from the total law of probability, which just means if I have this joint distribution, I can always write it as a series of conditional distributions, and eventually a marginal distribution. And so, for example, if I had fish weight, um, and fish water, uh, water temperature and air temperature, I could think about, okay, the distribution of fish weight given um, water temperature and air temperature. Um, I have these um, three models here. So I have a model for um, the fish weight given air temperature and water temperature, a model for water temperature given air temperature, and then a, a, a model for, or a distribution for the um, air temperature. So those make sense. I mean, those, that way of conditioning on that, I can, I can give you examples of models that are built that way in, in the science, in the literature. So in principle, it's easy then to turn this into a Bayesian framework and think about conditioning on data as well. I won't go into that because it's sort of in the background of this, but, but that whole Bayes theorem thing works if I have a more complicated set of hierarchical models. Okay. So what do you do with that, though? So this is where it starts getting challenging and, 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 and more realistic. And this is this notion, uh, most of you know this, I'm sure, but if you don't, an idea of Monte Carlo integration. So if I want that prior distribution of W in that hierarchical model, what I could do is I could, if I had some way to average out the effects of water temperature and air temperature, I would get back this distribution just of, of, of the weight. And so Monte Carlo integration is, is basically, well, if I can just sample from these distributions, I don't really need to do that integration. I can do it numerically. I just do samples. So here's an example. I have a distribution under two scenarios, two decisions, historical and, and climate change. I can sample from my distribution of air temperature. I plug those into the model for water temperature, given air temperature, and I get these distributions. And then I, I sample from that, and I put that into my distribution for uh, weight, given the water temperature. And these are the things that I want to compare then. Hey, OK, I can compare more formally, like in that Bayesian decision framework, and decide which action did I care about. All right? So that's pretty helpful. And it's cool, because it allows you to account for this cascade of uncertainty. There's uncertainty in every one of those distributions. And then even actually the components that go into them, including the parameters, which I'm not really talking about. So Gary, you really do this. And so a few years ago, we decided to do this um, in, a, in a real system. Um, I live in Missouri, which is in the dead center of the US. And um, I can ride my bike to the Missouri River in about 20 minutes. The Missouri River is one of the biggest um, river and systems in the world, and certainly the biggest in the U.S. Um, and it's very important for commerce and also for um, ecological um, purposes. And the pallid sturgeon, which is a prehistoric fish, is endangered, and it, and it lives in the Missouri River, in the U.S. at least. Um, and the reason why it's endangered is because people, um, well, for all sorts of reasons, but caviar is one. Caviar comes from sturgeon. Um, and so it's very much endangered. We want to know what's going to happen to this in the future. Uh, what do we need to do to manage the river to make that viable? And so what we did is we thought about this kind of cascade of uncertainty. So we had these large-scale global climate models called Atmospheric Ocean Global Climate Models, or GC AOGCMs. And then that connected into um, a regional climate model for North America. And we have multiple models for each of those. There's an experiment called NARCAP, which actually did this in a statistically viable way. And so we have all this output from these climate models. And then that feeds into a model for the um, hydrology of the Missouri River Basin. This is, um, I live right over here. And it goes all the way up into the mountains out to the west, the Rocky Mountains. And then from there, that goes into a, a local river condition model, which has to do with flow and temperature. And then that goes into a stochastic bioenergetics model, which sort of is like an individual-based model to, so that um, the fish respond to different things, flow, food sources, 
temperature in a bioenergetics way. So in other words, it, this is believed to be a scientifically valid model, which is trained on other kinds of data, et cetera. So it's a kind of an approximate Monte Carlo analysis. Not really a full one, because why not? Because I don't have enough samples from this distribution of climate uh, scenarios and, and the basin hydrology to really give me a, a complete idea. But it's, it's a start. And down at this level, we actually do have enough realization. So I'll come back to that here in a bit. So what do we find? Well, first of all, there's a large amount of uncertainty in this, as you can imagine. If I go all the way from the global climate down to fish weight, there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty there. But what we did learn is that you can definitely find significant differences in fish distributions. Well, this is actually showing by the way, is this is um, um, a part of, of the Missouri River where there's faster velocities. It's narrower, so it's faster. This is kind of the upper part of the lower Missis Missouri. Don't worry about that. Um, and this is a lower part of where it's wider and the velocities are slower. And these are all the different model combinations that, that sort of were the scenarios that we cared about. And what you'll see if you look at that is there are significant differences between models, sometimes dramatic differences, so there's a lot of uncertainty in these models. There's also differences between future and current climates in almost every single case. And then there's some more scientifically relevant things here too, which is that we don't see near as much change in the growth of the fish in this part of the river where there's faster velocities compared to the part where there's slower. And the other thing that we see is that there's less growth in all the models into the future in the slow part of the river, which is not a good sign. Okay. So we learned a lot from this, but we didn't talk about adaptation. And I'll come back to adaptation with fish later. But, but why didn't we? Well, because we didn't really get a good enough idea about the, of this distribution of fish weights to be able to say, okay, in this scenario, this might happen. I mean, it's useful, don't get me wrong, but it's not quite there. But people are doing this, and this is, this is um, in, in kind of practical, real world operational settings. And this is, I don't know if you've ever seen this, it's called My Climate View, which is um, produced here in Australia. And, and what it does is it gives, uh, you, you can type in a, an area, a location, and you can type in a crop, and it will give you these, um, uh, an idea about what's going to happen into the future. For example, growing season rainfall inconclusive, which is kind of uncertainty, right? Uh, minimal change for the wet days at harvest, et cetera. This is unprecedented. We have not had this before the last few years. Uh, maybe individual private companies have done it, but the, any, any producer can get on, or you and I can get on, I mean, I just did this. You can get on and you can get this information. So you can make decisions uh, maybe not so much so the uncertainty part of it, but you can at least make some decisions about what might happen. In the U.S., there's a similar kind of thing. This is experimental to do this with um, flood risk. And, and same idea. In this case, there really are uncertainty bounds associated with it. But kind of in this idea, same idea, this kind of Monte Carlo type approach. Okay? So those are useful, but they're sort of approximate in, in many in, in, in every sense, right? Because we don't really have all the distributions that we need. So they're not realistic to really make management decisions. Well, you could make a decision. It's better than nothing, right, for sure. But it's not really enough to support a decision, a, a dramatic decision about how you might adapt to a new climate scenario. And for example, in my fish example, we don't have anything about the ecosystem habitat in that model. We don't have anything about the prey, predator prey part of that model. We don't have anything about land use changes or how, this, how society might change um, as, as the future go, um, changes as well. So there's so many parts of the system that we can't or didn't account for in our, in our model. And then there's just limits to knowledge and uncertainty quantification. There's not enough realizations from these deterministic models and the watershed models to really give us Monte Carlo. Uh, there's insufficient understanding of processes and how they link together. We can't do Bayesian hierarchical models at that scale yet. Uh, we just don't have the, the uh, technology to implement it in such high dimensions, and I'll come back to that. Um, 
There's extreme values in here, and most of the statistics methods that we have and use don't really account for that in, in large scales. And then there's sampling bias uh, that actually gets confounded due to climate change. So I want to take the rest of my talk and give you some examples of these, what's being done and, and what could be done, and, and hopefully that'll kind of take us to the, to the end. And the first is about the complexity of the climate models. Why can't we get enough realizations from these big climate models? Well, they're, they're huge systems of, of partial differential equations across all the different, imagine that you've got to interact between the atmosphere and the physics of the atmosphere, the chemistry of the atmosphere, the interactions with water, interactions with the ecosystem, all of those things have to go into those models. And there, there's feedbacks going all over the place. A typical climate model, if you printed it out, would be 18,000 pages of text. And they take a long time to run, order of months to run. Many of the processes that are in this are parameterized, and actually, if you did them right, would themselves be probably 18,000 pages of printed text. They're also models of very complex systems. And so, it's just we're not there, right? We're, I mean, it just takes too long. They're useful but for, for many, many things. But so how can we possibly get enough samples of this to do any, um, and under different initial conditions or different boundary conditions or different physics parameterizations? Or how can we perform uncertainty quantification? And so one of the answers is to think about modeling the model or using surrogate models to emulate what's going on. So if I take the output from this climate model, perhaps I don't want to run that climate model. I'm going to run some statistical or machine learning model that emulates it, and call that a surrogate model, in a way that I can do so many runs that I can actually quantify the uncertainty associated with it. I can do experiments to see how, what would happen if I change this parameter and, and what would it do to the output. So this idea has been all around a long time. Um, in fact, I looked this up recently, not for this talk, but for, for another one. And you can find examples of, of surrogate models and emulators going back into the 60s, of, so emulating computer models. Um, really took off in the, in the 1980s with the statistical approaches, and then there's a really nice summary by the book by Bobby Gramercy, if you're interested in that topic. Historically, these are based on Gaussian processes, sometimes um, singular value decompositions or principal components, uh, looking at pretty small summaries of a really complex model. So what's we, what we really need is we need multivariate dynamic processes to emulate over 3D space and time across multiple variables. We need to account for extremes that, that might change in, in space or time, or be non-stationary. And we might need to learn some of the mechanistic processes that are actually going on in there. So this is all a topic of, of, of research, but there are some things that are being done. There's currently no um, system-wide system climate emulator that I know of. People have kind of do parts of it, but there's nothing that really does the whole system. Uh, the technology's not there. But what could, some promising developments, um, maybe we, we could use things that come from, from tensor-based models. And we've done, I've done some of that myself with, it, with my collaborator, Giri Gopalan. Um, not at the scale of climate models, but being able to emulate very complex space-time dynamics. Um, deep neural models with physics-informed neural networks. This is probably the most promising thing. I'll talk about this in a second. Potentially, this is the game changer. And then ways to account for extreme values, which I'll also talk about, because that's something I work in. OK, you might have seen this. Um, uh, came out last year. Um, it's called ForecastNet out of the NVIDIA team. And basically, it's using adaptive Fourier neural operators to learn how to do medium range weather forecast models. So a medium range weather forecast model, meaning from 12 hours to about 15 days, is the state of the art. That's what weather centers across the world do. Okay. And they're, they're almost as complicated as a climate model. Not quite. They run faster. But they're still very complex systems of, of differential equations uh, and complex systems. The thing that's really cool and almost unbelievable about this is that um, this neural net version of one of these models 
operates on the order of five orders of magnitude faster than the, climate, the weather models and has comparable, if not better, accuracy. Most meteorologists didn't believe this up front because it just like, wait a minute, how, how could this possibly be? Um, but all it, it seems to be true. So 80,000 times faster. So what does that mean? That means that I can start thinking about ensembles of these models. In fact, this team here that's been looking at this stuff, which by the way, um, has some statisticians on it, people that some of us know. Um, they have 7,000, they ran 7,000 ensemble members from this and are looking at it, like how realistic are those distributions. It's to the point where it's faster to rerun the model than it is to save it. That's just a game changer. It's nothing like that has ever existed in weather forecasting and certainly not in climate modeling. So the idea that I'm suggesting, and it's, it's sure to come, is that this same technology will also be used to build these climate models soon. And then we'll be able to actually get thousands, if not millions of realizations of what the future climate might look like. Total game changer. Um, not quite as exciting, but it's the work that I'm doing, so I'm going to present it. So, um, Most emulators can't deal with extreme values. And why does that matter? Well, because the climate, the things that we care about are extremes, right? That's what leads to massive precipitation or droughts or, or flood events. Um, and and this, the, the current methods don't do that. The other thing to point out is that extremes don't just happen kind of randomly. They happen in clusters. And so here's a couple of examples. This is um, from just last week, um, fires in, in Australia. This is the drought intensity over the US last week as well or a couple weeks ago. Um, and you can see they're clustered, right? So the mathematics of extremes has been around a while. It's, it's interesting, very interesting mathematically. Some of you might work in that space. But to start thinking about it in the context of dependent extremes gets really difficult because of, of, the, of the mathematics to make it realistic, to do it on any kind of scale. And it's, it's, we've come a long way in the last few years, but we're still not quite there. And so what I want to present is some stuff that I've recently done that's kind of pushing that boundary a little bit, at least. Um, and so we're going to use, um, we're going to emulate extremes with, with a variational autoencoder. And I'll kind of explain that in a second. And what that, it's really good to emulate models, like complex models, like climate models, um, or parts of them. But it also could be a situation where I have a data set that I only have one example of, one realization. I want to kind of think about how I could sample that more, uh, get more samples from that same distribution. The example I'm going to present here, and I'm going to go into this more tomorrow, is, is thinking about coral bleaching. And so coral bleaching tends to happen when the temperature of the water gets above 31 degrees Celsius. And so if I'm, what I'm interested in then is can I ca characterize the distribution in space and in time of where that might happen? Okay. So this is hard because it's really difficult, as I said, to build non-stationary models for, for dependent spatial or temporal extremes in, in high dimensions. And so we developed this um, uh, kind of a novel model, but the reason why we can implement it is because we use this variational autoencoder to do it. Um, this is with my colleague, Lakun Zhang, Xiaoyu Ma, and Raphael Huser. So a variational autoencoder, ignore the bottom part, um, these are the sort of things that lead to deep fakes. So um, they're cool in the sense that they take uh, something like an image and they project it down into a lower dimensional random space and then they have a decoder that projects it back out. So if you're familiar with principal components, principal components is a type of autoencoder. Okay, so that's been around forever and ever. This is different because it, the encoder is a, is a deep neural network and the decoder is a deep neural network. So you can learn the mappings that go from the original space into the latent probability space, and then you can learn the mapping that comes back out. So the idea is then I can generate if, you know, things that look like something else, and so that's why they, they're useful for deep fakes. So what we did that's different is that ordinarily this, this latent space is, is just Gaussian distributions, independent normal distributions. We're using heavy tail distributions to, to do extremes. And then the decoder that we have is this um, kind of new 
model that can do non-stationary extremes. I, again, the details, if you're interested, I'll talk about tomorrow. But um, what does it do? Well, it allowed us to sort of think about these four regions of the Red Sea and think about what the distribution of exceedance, uh, of area that, uh, of exceedance over 31 degrees Celsius where coral bleaching might occur. And what you can see is that from 1985 to 2015, there was a dramatic change. But what I can tell you is I can show you what the distributions are of these. So we can actually make formal inference again because we have these distributions under different scenarios. Um, and I didn't mention it, but, but we have only, um, this is based on 30,000 emulated things, uh, realizations over a really large data set. Okay, so, so this is, again, not the game changer that, that the um, uh, NVIDIA team is, but in both cases, we're making use of deep neural technology to get solutions that have not been possible before. Okay. The other challenge that's always present here is learning more about the system. And, and those of us who work in applied statistics are always working on that. I wanna give a plug here to what's going on at Wollongong, say, where does the carbon go? One of the big parts of this system is understanding the carbon cycle, if I think about global warming. And so you may or may not know that the kind of world leaders in doing this right now are, are here, most of them, some of you are in the room, um, and, and what's called Wombat, which is a, a, a flux inversion type modeling to figure out where um, uh, carbon's going in a very Bayesian, uh, uncertainty quantification driven framework, game changer. And, and so that's the kind of stuff that we need to do to learn about the system. The other part that's really a challenge and it's gonna be needed here to do formal uncertainty quantification for climate adaptation is to use efficient Bayesian computation. And that means high dimensions, it means making it faster. And again, I'm gonna give some shout out here um, to some of the stuff that's going on in Wollongong. One of these ideas is using variational bays. That's also what was in that autoencoder stuff that I presented. Um, neural bays, again, um, leaders are here in Wollongong um, of that. Um, there's there's a, a kind of description of how AI can play a role more generally in a, in a recent paper there. And then um, exact bays, which is sort of doing this instead of sampling from this, actually getting these things um, in, a, in a more efficient way. And again, that connection is because John Bradley, who leads, is leading some of that work, was an old student at Ohio State and was a postdoc of mine. Um, and so he's kind of leading some of that work. Okay, so um, the last kind of part that I wanted to really talk about was sampling bias. And um, here's, here's the long and short of this. So, um, climate change in terms of hydrology and its effects on, say, rivers where fish live is very much driven by the seasonal cycle, okay? And that seasonal cycle is changing, and it's changing in ways that you might not think about. The seasonality is changing differently depending on where you are. It's not just a, a constant change. Um, so what does that mean? It means the peak precipitation time change is changing, but it's different here in Wollongong than it might be in Darwin, okay? Um, and so, if you're going to assess how the fish are gonna change in the river, you need to know that. And so I've been involved in a project where we've been doing this for a while, and I'm just gonna kind of, we had a thousand stream gauges over the northern part of the US. This is what a typical annual cycle looks like, and you can see this kind of, basically three harmonics, and there's a reason for why there's sort of three real harmonics here. Um, and then these change, these peaks and valleys here come from little like storm events that happen. So if you wanted to model that, um, well, first of all, this is just to show you that uh, from two different locations, how that's changing across time is quite different. So we build a model to look at this across all these locations, and we find that this, for example, the maximum flow day is changing on the order of 12 days, depending on where you are, either plus six or minus six from where it is. That's significant. Why? Because it affects the life cycle of many different ecological species. And so we also find that there's clusters to this, and again, I, uh, that's not really relevant so much. So why, how does that relate to adaptation? Well, it matters because, like I said, fish respond to this in, in different ways. They respond to the fact that it's the flow's more or the temperature's different. 
And so when they spawn, that makes, that's why one of the changes that happened. But it also affects the sampling protocol. If I'm a biologist, I go out to sample these things certain times of the year, and then if I look at how the system is changing over time, there's a great deal of uncertainty when you, when you sample uh, fish in, in a, well, you're not gonna get them all, right? And so there's this confounding that goes on between the fact that the system is changing, but my sampling protocol is not. So our project is to kind of say, okay, these are biased samples, how do we fix that? That's the adaptation. Take what we already have, adapt it so we can get a better unbiased estimate. Um, this is work with some colleagues of mine, and we can detect trends. Again, I'm just gonna say, um, we can correct the historical samples and we can design how to take new samples in going into the future. And, and here's an example of that. If there's a trend out there and there's uncertainty in my observations, uh, we have models that can deal with the uncertainty and then it takes a lot longer than what we have available to really establish that there's a trend. So we can, we can start designing experiments based on that. The very last part I wanna talk about just briefly um, all this, you might say, the, the classic example of adaptation is geoengineering. What does that mean? That means I'm gonna do things to the environment to make climate change not happen this bad. It's like putting aerosols into the stratosphere, okay, which is what volcanoes do, by the way. Um, removing carbon dioxide, um, sequestration of carbon in other ways, um, all sorts of things that people are thinking about. And, and the thing is that these are it's quite controversial, right? Because we don't really know what the unintended consequences might be. We don't really understand the system well enough for all those reasons I mentioned before. And so you may know about this. This is what happens when you try to change the environment uh, with unintended consequences, right? So in this case, it was the introduction of the cane toad to deal with the beetles that were in the sugar cane fields in Australia. And sure enough, now you have ginormous um, cane toads advancing um, further south and, and, and west, way beyond what's happening here. That's unintended consequence. So good intention, bad consequence. One of the ways people are starting to think about these though, because we don't have data, is how can we transfer what we do have to do, to do inference about this? So for example, if I wanna think about stratospheric ozone, or stratospheric um, aerosols and in introducing those, let's look back at what's happened in, in volcanic eruptions and see if we can do enough, uh, get enough information from that to decide whether it would really make sense or not. And there's some nice work being done in that space from the statistical uncertainty quantification space. So there's so much more to do. Um, we have to build models that, that have these interrelated, inner um, complexity uh, across all sorts of different parts of the process with uncertainty quantification. We're not good at that. We're not very good at all about linking processes. That's the, mis that's the one area of all these climate models and weather models that's the weakest. It's, it's this nonlinear interaction that goes on. We're not good at modeling nonlinear interactions in statistics or in any, but unless we have some, some very uh, well-defined um, mathematical reasons to do so. so. So that's a big problem for us. We need better ways to perform uncertainty quantification, and decision analysis, one reason for that is there's some things that we can't really quantify, right? And an example of that is like subjectivity, which you can kind of quantify, but like black swan events. So something that's outside, nobody's ever thought of it before. How do you account for that when you're doing uncertainty quantification? So the economists have come back to this notion of deep uncertainty, uh, which was originated by Knight. Um, but the idea is to make um, a formal decision framework um, in the presence of things that can't be known, which I don't know much about it yet, but it's kind of interesting. Um, and then I think the deep neural networks are gonna make a big difference here, and I think we need to improve communication. That's a big part of it. So in conclusion, uncertainty quantif quantification is crucial to understand climate adaptation. Uh, we're getting better at it, but we got a long ways to go. Um, you know, the important things are really gonna see, we haven't even thought about very much how to link the climate stuff to the social stuff in a way that can accommodate uncertainty. Uh, and to really make a decision, you have to do that. Uh, we're just not there, not even close. But it's, it's, we can still adjust to sales, I think. Um, I think we can do it. And I think those of us who enjoy and, and thrive on interdisciplinary uh, collaboration, 
the future's ours. That's really where we're at. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity. What if you're considering a practice that is already done, like a shipment made practice, like tilling in you know, agriculture or adding fertilizer, and then you're simply not tilling the soil or uh, simply not putting chemicals or like certain chemicals in the fertilizer? This can have huge impacts on carbon sequestration of our agriculture, but it's not inherently dangerous, I guess, like there's, it's not, to me it seems like there's not many unforeseen consequences because you're so, you're just modifying a human activity, I yeah. guess. Yeah, no, I th I, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, I, th I think that all of these, there's different scales of, of the importance of uncertainty quantification and, and the people, and people's reaction to it. I mean, I think in some ways this is why this problem is, is almost impossible because if I'm a producer and I've always, you know, used tilling as my method for um, planting and then somebody says, no, you should use a no-till, you know, then I have to trade off between um, chemical ad additives versus the tilling process and blah, 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 then that's going to be controversial and it might not even change within a generation, right? But I think it's still reasonable to say that's one action, those are two different actions, and so at least if we quantified the uncertainty associated with them, then the next step is, in, in I guess this more social, environmental social context, to decide what would we really do, what would, what would actually ever be plausible in this scenario. So I don't know if I'm really answering your question, but I, but I think there are always gonna be controversial solutions, and I think, that's why this is really um, just interested in the extreme value um, work that you did. Um, wondering, like, what is your sense of how much that will, would impact the kind of models that are used in this space? Like, uh, I'm sure most of the models are not what they sort of the correlation of the extreme values. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting because the you, presumably the physical model, say a climate model, its extremes are going to come from the boundary conditions. Right, because the physics are the physics, but yet if I, if I perturb it in a way that's going to push it into an extreme part of its phase space, then that's going to happen. I think what we're thinking about is when we look at, say, if I'm trying to analyze the data or I'm trying to emulate it, then I think we need to really be able to accommodate that because our statistical models aren't typically dealing with those boundary conditions. I mean, you could, and some of us have worked in that a little bit, but. But so if you're, if you're going to just look at the data or look at the output and it has extremes in it and we're not thinking of a causal way, then I think that's where really where we have to think about extremes. Because otherwise, like, like I said, I think that it's in the models, right? Those models will produce extreme events if the forcings are right. But to, it goes back to my point that one of the things that's probably not good enough yet is how we parameterize those interactions. Like how, do the, how, how does, say, changing the um, uh, amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, how does that really affect downstream what's going on with, with temperature? You know, we, you know, it's in the model, but I don't think that those interactions are, are that great. And part of the reason is we don't really have a good understanding in those models yet of all the ways that, that the carbon cycle is actually being done. So, so some of the extremes are probably tempered by that. But I feel like that's more of a scientific question. But when you go to analyze the output or when you go to emulate it, that's when you really need to think about extreme. I've got a bit of a lower level question. I'm an engineer that makes data loggers and sensor platforms for climate research. And so in terms of raw data collection and uncertainty in that area, are there any improvements you'd like to see in how data is captured at that raw level? Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, my, I'm kind of limited in my knowledge there. Um, originally, I was an atmospheric scientist and actually worked in data collection for air pollution 
And back then we had um, automated sensors that we thought were really cool. But at the end of the day, we threw out almost all the information. And I think that's still happening for most, most systems. And I think um, there are two things. If you think about satellite data is an example of this, where we've got tremendous amounts, terabytes of data coming in all the time, can't possibly use it all. And so one of the other things, there's, we're faced with an interesting problem. In some places we have too little data, and some places we have too much. So what I'd like to see us do is think really carefully about um, ways to summarize data that could be used when we have too much, but also design experiments to see at what resolution do we really need this you know, other platform information going forward. And I don't know, I, mean, I think engineers are better at that than statisticians, um, but I don't think it's been done in a cohesive way yet. So to think about how this impacts the potential adaptation strategy that somebody might take when all these things are interacting. But that, I should put that bullet point down because it's really important, not to mention the biases that, that come out. Yeah. Hi, Chris. So earlier in your talk, you pointed out that a lot of um, these changes might come down to the level of the individual um, and, and sort of personal accountability. Um, but a lot of folks, uh, you know, aren't statisticians, don't have uh, that concept for distribution between models. And, um, but many times people are just focused on you know, what's, what's the predicted value, is it going to rain today, is it not? Not so much, you know, if it rains, what might the accumulation look like, what's the, what's the distribution around that? So, in terms of the importance of uncertainty modification, um, have you, can you comment on, or have you, do you have much experience with communicating um, kind of interpret that information to the layperson, make that part of their thinking and decision making? Yeah, that's a really, really important point, Josh. Um, you know, in, in my days as a meteorologist, this was always crucial because people don't understand, at least in the U.S., don't really understand what the probability of precipitation means. And, and not because they don't, it's, it's because it, its definition is really convolved, right? It's, it's not just what, where I am right now, is it gonna be a 50% chance of precipitation? It's, a, it's an aerial average in some weird way. And, and people, there's been all sorts of experiments in, in psychological sciences about people interpretation of probability. And it's all over the map, as you might expect. So the IPCC has, um, they don't use numbers for probability, they use words, which is probably just as problematic. I don't think we have a good answer. I, I, I think, you know, one of the things that these operational products like My Climate View is trying to do is to give, like, producers some sense of what uncertainty is, just like, okay, you know, broadly speaking, we can't really say if, how it's going to change in the future. It's likely to be higher, likely to be lower. That's probably about the best we're going to do. And then to say how in your individual actions are going to influence it, I think that's wide open, right? We're not even very good at individual-based models or agent-based models in quantifying uncertainty yet, and that's part of all this. So yeah, I'm throwing my hands up. It's a great question, and you're right, and I don't think we have a good answer. That doesn't mean we can't, decision makers can't still think about uncertainty quantification at, at larger levels, but I think for individuals, that's why I had that communication with two um, uh, exclamation points, because we, we have got to figure that out. Thanks, Chris. So thank you very much. Let's put our hands together for Chris. Thank you.